Welcome to Faith, Reason, and Geekdom. I'm your Johnny Flexer, Roger. And I'm Dusty. My brothers and sisters in Christ, join me every week as we work out these three perspectives in our everyday lives. That's what we call Christian Jenny Flexing. I'm sitting here getting ready to do the podcast. This rebirth. I feel energized. I'm into it. I'm like, yes, I got this. I researched my topics. I got my drinks. I got the table set up. Everything's going great. I'm so excited. I hear the doorbell ring. Talking a little bit before, and then you just hit me right over the head with a brick. And, and not in the good way. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I could see it. Like, there was this look of disbelief as I yeah. was telling you. But... You know, as we're recording this podcast, there's a developing news story that's maybe a couple of hours old, a shooting in the backyard of San Antonio, Texas, which is in Uvalde. Prior to this news incident, the claim to fame of Uvalde was that it was the hometown of Matthew McConaughey. And now it's going to live in infamy on a list, a growing list of school shootings in this country, uh, we have in Texas, it ranks automatically as the second deadliest school shooting in Texas. The first one being the University of Texas way back in 1966 when a gunman climbed the, the tower at the University of Texas and uh, with several weapons began to open fire and killed uh, 13 people and wounded at least 30 others. Today, 16 deaths at Robb Elementary School, the type of school we hear where generations of people from Uvalde. Uvalde is a seven square foot, uh, seven seven miles radius. Not that big. Not that big, okay? A lot of people live there, have lived there their whole lives. This is a shocking incident. An 18-year-old gunman, these are early uh, bits of information we're getting walked into the school after being involved already in a shootout with police prior, you, right? Prior to this, uh, the, apparently from the details that I heard on the radio coming to record the, bro- the the podcast today, the guy was in an incident with his grandmother, got into it with the cops. It was a shootout. He walks into the elementary school and kills at least at this point, 14 children and a teacher that were killed in in the in the shooting there, uh, and you know the first thing that jumped out at me was I was thinking about the other school shootings in in the history of our our country. You hear uh, Columbine, um, you hear um, you know, Sandy uh, Hook, Sandy Hook, which was probably similar to this. Yes, uh, in that it it involved young young people. These are not high school students. These are elementary school, innocent lives. Parkland was the one that I couldn't remember. Um, What do we do with this? You know, we're supposed to, this is a podcast about faith, reason, and geekdom. And I know that you geeked out at one point and started to kind of look into the other school shootings just by chance Mm. that you had done that historically And we started talking a little bit about it, and I said, well, no, no, hold on to that topic. Let's talk about it uh, during the podcast. So what did you find? You you said very boldly that you found some similarities with those shooters of those others, uh, other incidents. Yeah. This is, uh, like, again, this is, this is just our topic is a little bit shifted, but, again, it's a historic second biggest in Texas. We have to touch on this. Lack of love, lack of humanity – is a big, isolation. Yeah, there you go. Isolation, a victim mentality as well, a hatred of being. When I say being, I mean reality. Um, they're atheistic. Now, again, I'm not saying, or you're atheist, you're going to do mass shooting. Obviously, I'm not saying. I'm just saying by the numbers. But if you read their writings, which I've read some of the Columbine shooters' writings, horrific. You find this sense of hatred of being reality. When I mean being, I mean existence itself. What is existence or itself? We would call that God in classical theism. That's what we, from Aquinas to Augustine, we see God as existence itself. And they hate that. 
And when you have somebody who hates being that plays that victim, like they're the, again, some of them had tough lives. And again, we all do. We all do. And not saying, oh, get over it, but this tough life, what are you going to do with it? Right? And it reminds me of the Cain and Abel story. And it's, it's, just, it's the same thing. You have Cain bringing his fruits. You have Abel bringing his fruits. God, for whatever reason, there's, there's a little bit, you know, theologians say that Cain uh, did not bring his best fruits. He didn't do his best and give it to God. And that's why God looked on Abel's versus Cain. There, there's other theologians that say, no, you know what? I think it's the case of the rain, uh, it rains on the good and the bad. I don't think Cain necessarily did anything wrong. God just, for whatever reason, you know, bad things happen. He just favored Abel, and that drove Cain to, like, a vicious, murderous rage, a victim mentality that he had. And that victim mentality says, "You, I'm going to shake my fist at the sky, God. And what does that lead to? It leads to doing the worst, spiting God. How do you spite existence? How do you spite God? By killing the best of us. And that's a metaphor for us, too. And that leads to Scripture. Because he killed Abel, the best of us, the best of us, mm-hmm. and he killed him. Yeah. The famous line, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, we are. We are. We are to love each other. But when you have people like this killer, this eight, young 18-year-old that has this so much hate and anger, and there's even writings from the Columbine killers talking about how they love animals, that they want the earth to go back the way it was where the animals ruled because they hated humanity. Interesting. Because if, even if they don't say the word God, they're trying to take the revenge out. And it's not just to kill yourself. Because you kill yourself, that's it. But to them, what's the worst? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To take out the innocent, kill them in a mass shooting, and then take out yourself. But some of them do, but then some of them get caught. And that, that's a little bit of the connections that, that I saw uh, looking into this topic. And it's very... What, what mm-hmm. I'm... What I'm... What's present to me. Pray, pray, pray that the people who are paid to figure these t- things out and our leaders can come up with some solution to this because this keeps happening. And then, you know, it plays out over the next few weeks and everybody forgets and then it happens again, uh, which is very sad. But my what I was present to was the mindset of these individuals, which you're talking about. What kind of mindset has it that you can walk into an elementary school, a high school, a place of learning where the innocents are there to fill their mind with knowledge and the parents have dropped them off that morning having seen them at breakfast and never going to see them again alive. What mindset is it that it's okay to do that? And then I was thinking, well, you know, there's the mindset also of sickness, of evil, of, of, of self-harm, of isolation, which is, by the way, we've learned in, in, in Catholic uh, circles <laughs> The best place for the devil to work. Uh, And and if you don't believe in the devil, then that's too bad because he still exists. doesn't matter whether you believe in him or not. And that's a a huge topic of its own for some future broadcast. But the devil does his best work when you are isolated, when you are away from others, from being loved, from whatever. God, they say, has no dominion over the devil when he is between your two ears in, in your mind. And, and that malignancy, that evil, that darkness can certainly skew your mind. It certainly has skewed all of our minds at yeah. some point, right, in our lives. But when somebody commits suicide and takes their own life, much less somebody else's, what kind of mercy does God have on this person, on this 18-year-old who was killed, by the way, today by police? Um, St. Faustina apparently wrote, uh, uh, you know, that God has special mercy and gives the opportunities for the person who who is going to die three opportunities apparently to repent and since god is both all powerful and all knowing he can do so probably in a mere mere seconds right we can't begin to understand that but that's part of our our faith and our and our reasoning uh to help us wrap our minds I thought it was fitting that right before I walked into the door as I was listening to coverage on the radio, uh, a statement from the Archbishop uh, of San Antonio, 
uh, and forgive me because I'm new to the area. I'm old to the area. I grew up in San Antonio, <laughs> yeah. but I've been gone for 30 years doing you know things, and I'm still back and forth to the West Coast to, to L.A. But the Archbishop said something. He didn't condemn. He didn't have any uh, <laughs> advice other than we need to pray right now. Yeah. We need to pray, and we need to unify, and we need to be lights for each other, yeah. and we need to... Uh, ask God to have mercy on this situation, on on the children, on the people who will miss those children the most, their parents, their family. There's still people on the radio right now as we're recording this who are looking for for children. There was one woman who was distraught looking for her daughter. And and there are kids even as we speak that are being shuttled still to University Hospital here in San Antonio, 60 miles away. Uh, so this is an, uh, an ongoing thing, but we needed to talk about this. Yeah, um, we we it's felt fitting. strongly about this because it it just so happens yeah. that the topic today was going to be Roe v. Wade, mm-hmm. the Supreme Court, the subject of abortion. Yes. So let's let's set this up, okay? So what are we doing here? Well, yeah, where are fa- we? Yeah, what, why, what are we? Why are you even I, listening I to why, us? Why are you in my house right now? Who are you? Who are you? To <laughs> just, no, but this is faith, reason, and geekdom. Um, Jason Nunez, who's been on the show before, uh, would you just introduce yourself? Sure thing. Well, hello, Roger. Dusty, how's it going? Good, brother. Uh, so good to be back here. I am a, I am a cradle Catholic, and uh, I work for a Catholic nonprofit evangelization ministry, and uh, I'm on fire for God, not just on Sunday, but seven days a week, 365 days a year. Yeah, cool. And it's, you know, one could say that my life has been one of suffering. Uh, I've heard people compare me to the Book of Job. Um, <laughs> as, um, you and me both. That's as, awesome. <laughs> now, as a, I'm, I'm kind of fitting the stereotypic here, the stereotype here, but uh, I honestly haven't read the Book of Job all the way through yet, wow. so I'm 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 kind of curious to to see what they mean by that. But uh, I can mm-hmm. I can <laughs> gather why that is. But hey, it's you know, not a comedy. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> sure, it's sure, not, I, not uh, sure, certainly not a comedy. But uh, hey, good to have right. you back on, Jason Nunez. Oh, yeah. Good to be here um, again. I, I'm the co-host Roger, and I have some good news because now I have a new co-host, new co-producer, new teammate uh, slash. Hangout buddy slash uh, talk about fellow NBA geek. slash fellow geek fellow fellow faith reasoner. I don't I don't I don't think that's Jenny Flector, a new guy and part of the the uh, the Catholic Avengers, the Christian Avengers, or if you will, Dusty Garza. If you could give us introduction, a lot of faith and a lot of cool stories, and I think he's an awesome dude. So uh, introduce Thank yourself, you. man. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Thank you for inviting me. To be part of the Faith Avengers here. <laughs> we are all definitely geeks. Um, I have an interesting story, very similar actually, I think, to to you, Jason, mm-hmm. in that my my life has also been compared to the Book of Job by a few <laughs> people who, who really, really know me. Sure. And that's, uh, you know, I'm learning to be authentic. I'm learning to be more open about who exactly I am and so forth because I come from the world mostly of entertainment. Um but I've also been involved in professional sports and broadcasting and Hollywood and all, and I still am. Um, I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas. Born here. Uh, yeah. Raised here. Mm, yeah. I went to uh, school in California, was mm-hmm. blessed enough to make my dreams come true and go to uh, the University of Spoiled Children, USC, <laughs> and uh, graduated from there with all intents of coming back to mm-hmm. Texas, where, where I love. And... Uh, Unfortunately or unfortunately, my, my, my career kept me there. I am a two-time Emmy Award-nominated television and film producer. I have been involved in everything, all kinds of projects from children's television to sports, uh, college basketball, pro basketball, uh, to giving back in the form of being an agent uh, in, in Hollywood, uh, to being an executive producer, a writer, um, all kinds of a stuff. A litany of... A, a litany. litany. There you go. That's but you a know, theme today. Litany. I, I, I was reflecting on this the other day because what brought me back to Texas uh, recently was an opportunity to be of service to my parents. Mm. And um, God rest her soul, my mom recently passed uh, after suffering uh, for a very long time with Parkinson's. And... Uh, it didn't take us but two seconds. Uh, luckily, I have a partner 
uh, Kira, who is the love of my life. And we, when we came to visit last uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, uh, we saw the situation with my mom and with my dad and they're, they're older. And my dad has been helping carry that cross for her for a long time her, of her illness. Uh, but we saw, and we said, look, we can be of service. We can advocate for them. We can help them. Let's, let's come back here. And I'm going to take a risk of uh, putting my entire career at risk, but I know that God's not going to punish me. No good deed goes unpunished. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it took a lot of faith. Okay. No, no kidding. It's easy to look back and say, yeah, that was easy, but it was hard. We, we sold everything and we came back here and I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I still travel back and forth. Uh, to both coasts because the other part of me is I work as a, a consultant to publicly traded companies. Uh, we do a lot of visibility and investor awareness for certain uh, companies. I love Wall Street. I love the business side. I, I found a way in my career to marry both. Uh, and I'm working now on a very, very special project that I can't talk a lot about, but it involves geekdom man out the yin yang we are working with a a comic book publishing company that is uh on tap to become the next marvel they've already produced one movie and they've got another one on tap at paramount could you say who i I, i'm not allowed i'm under nda yeah because the the problem is that and you know who it is yeah yeah we talk about this all the time we we geek out on it yeah yeah yeah, yeah, but but the reality is we this comic book company it's a huge publisher does not want uh, to forecast uh, or, or, or to show what their next moves are going to be. But I'm, by God's blessing, intricately yeah. involved uh, uh, in that. And, and anybody who knows me, yeah. who grew up knowing me as a kid on the west side here in San Antonio, mm-hmm. knows what a dream come true that yeah. is to even just be involved at that level and to see these amazing projects. But on the other side of me yeah. is the side that was a cradle Catholic like Jason yeah. and who... Uh, didn't appreciate my faith or know my faith the way I do now. And that faith came, God uses those around you to bring you closer to him. Yeah. Uh, and that, that, that faith definitely grew uh, when I experienced a, 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 a life-changing event um, that drew me closer to God and to drew me closer to my faith. And, and it eventually led to me becoming a youth minister at my old wow. parish and to being involved with different uh, uh, groups, including a, 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 a religious ministry that does retreats. Uh, and I know that some of the people at my old search ministry in Los Angeles are going to be listening to this podcast. There's a whole slew of them, and I, and I send them a big shout out. But uh, I'm now involved here in San Antonio, very quickly, the arms of the church embraced me when I got here, yeah. welcomed us, even when we were just on vacation and talking about moving back. Yeah. Um, and that was also something that we did very quietly. We didn't want to project. There's a lot of people who might be listening who didn't even know that I left LA and that I'm here for the time being. <laughs> yeah. They're, they're just like, what? Wait, you're what? Here? Yeah. yeah. But, but I love it. And we met mm-hmm. uh, at one of those ministries here in yeah. San Antonio. Sheen. Uh, we were discussing the teachings of Bishop Sheen. Mm. And you want to talk about the prayer today uh, in these dark subjects that we cover of being a light for others and praying for others. You know, in in my old ministry, in the search ministry, uh, we talked about our responsibility having the light of faith to ourselves and to others is to be like a candle. We all know people like even people today after this horrific incident whose whose candle has gone out and who are just left without that light and and it's our job to be a candle of light to them and help them and light that candle again and the only way you can do that is by getting closer to each other and being supportive to each other and a lot of prayer you know when somebody dies like i just described my mom passed away our faith tells us especially when you see somebody suffer for so long that they're in a better place. And we can talk about that because, man, did I learn some lessons about suffering through her and to watching my dad carry that cross with her. And I I love them. I I love them in a a way that I've never loved them before by seeing how they live their faith in their marriage 
and how they raised how, us. Long, you said what 50, 60 years? They were together, right? They were together for sixty yeah, years. I remember boyfriend you told and girlfriend. Me that. They had a very long boyfriend and girlfriend, you know, relationship yeah. and and so forth. Anyway, long story made short, and I've gone way too long in this introduction, but I really kind of wanted to bow tie it and 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 then move on to our topic. Uh, is the fact that we all have a responsibility. And when I met you <laughs> at Sheen, we, we do this yeah. litany right before we yeah. talk because this is like a sharing type, almost like uh-huh. a 12-step meeting for yeah. Catholics, right? <laughs> like, that's hi, that's the way I walk away from it, right? We're also, yeah, no, I'm a sinner. Hello. I'm a sinner. And we start yeah. with I am a sinner. Actually, we start with a litany of humility because every yeah. one of us in that room is going to get a chance to share yep. their opinion on that lesson that morning, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So we just yeah. heard Sheen, for example, this this past week talk about the the sacrament of holy, yeah. orders. holy orders. And so everyone, we go around the table, yeah. and, and sometimes there's eight people, sometimes there's 20 people, but at yeah. the end of the day, what's communicated to me by us all sitting there praying the litany yeah. of, of, of humility yeah. is, hey, don't take yourself too seriously, yeah. right? Uh, share what you have to share, but God <laughs> get, grant me the yeah. humility, right? Um, and you were kind of struggling with that when I met you at that meeting. And the very first thing I walked up to you, (laughs) because you had just shared something that clued me into that, is I said to you, Roger, are you freaking kidding me? God gave you this talent and ability, gave us all voices. We need to use them. And you don't, you're playing small does not serve God. And so that all of a sudden weeks later has sparked this entire revamp, this podcast Mm -hmm. in hopes that we can be a light for others. And that we can share something that might stick with someone. And, and our goal, as we dis- discuss these topics, is to actually try to bring value yeah. to, to what podcast listeners are consuming. We're doing this out of the goodness of our heart yeah. and that hopefully somebody will connect to us. Yes. And we've revamped now this, this podcast. Um, podcasting, I used to laugh at it because I used to be on broadcast <laughs> television and yeah, motion pictures. And I think it'll never last. Like right? it'll <laughs> never last. Yeah, the democratization yeah, of media with a cigar and like an old like ah, see, yeah. look at here, see, and look oh at this. Oh my <laughs> gosh, boy! You know, I, me- I remember that Time oh. Magazine <laughs> yeah. p- picture of the magic uh, with the left. Magic goes in the dunk and dunk. <laughs> You're like the old school broadcaster voice. <laughs> yes, like, exactly. Well, Kareem you know, and it's funny because I, I used to I used to do broadcasting <laughs> yeah, for NCAA. Yeah. Uh, you know, college basketball Spurs and, and, and yeah. for the Spurs uh-huh. and stuff. But I got to tell you, I remember that Time Magazine cover, the person of the year, mm. and it was like a, a picture of YouTube, like YouTube, the per, the broad, the, these people that are yeah. podcasters and, and influencers <laughs> and this whole new wave of people who are famous for, for their personalities online, yeah. which sparks an entire debate because – and again, we'll talk about this kind of stuff because I can geek out on it all day. Yeah. Entertainment. Yeah. Like, what's next? Like, yeah, I, 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 I think people will be blown away by how immersive entertainment is going to become. But the one thing that I noticed that I learned in my broadcast and television and producing career is that you have to serve up something that people are going to want to consume, especially when there are 500 television channels and nothing yeah. on. You know, you want to feed the people who show up that you've invited to the restaurant. And this is our restaurant. Yeah. And uh, all we're trying to do is be, be honest, share our faith the best way we know it. And trust me when I tell you this, listeners, they, these, these two guys that are here with me and other people who will come in and out of this broadcast yeah. are way smarter than me when it comes oh, to faith. No, I think my strength complex. is faith oh. uh, and what I've done and what I've learned about my faith. You guys are yeah. definitely reason. And I can certainly, you know, play ball with you guys, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm not afraid to get on the same court. But you guys do a lot of book studying and have a lot of of feed for Mm. the audience, I think. And I'm excited about that that and being part of that. So I appreciate you guys. This is kind of like an intro because there's going to be plenty. This is almost like a the um, thing about Age of Ultron where it's not really that movie. It's setting up this movie and setting up that movie. (laughs) And it's like setting up this movie. So just hang on because there's so many stories so many topics and stories I want to share and Jason has a lot of incredible ones and you have a lot of incredible ones and I have a lot of incredible ones so I'm just so excited for this but yeah and you too too you have the faith you too too what did I say that was like did you what I just made up a word you you too also have that uh, you said compared to the book of Job 
And that's funny because, like, my wife compares me to the book of Leviticus. So, like, I don't know, <laughs> I like, it. am I overbearing? Am I too right. strict? Another like, book I, don't, I haven't read. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, might very like, well uh, be. Like, people compare me to the book of Leviticus. I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing. I know. You know what? God <laughs> makes us God makes us all so different and gives us all yeah. so many gifts. Yeah. But, you know, touching about this on this dark, dark mm. topic today with the school shooting in Uvalde. The, the topic we were really mm. gathered to discuss today was abortion mm. mm-hmm. and Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And, you know, the first thing that jumps out at me as I was going to prepare today's notes was, uh, we're all men at this table. Yeah. Uh, it's widely regarded that we really don't have a say mm. when it comes to the topic of abortion. Mm. That what the woman yeah. wants goes. Mm. <laughs> and I know at least one guy who's a good friend. Uh, whose privacy I'll respect by not revealing yeah. who it is, but it's somebody who's close to me, whose life was really distraught, almost destroyed yeah. by the fact that he dated a girl, they got pregnant, uh, and she decided to have an abortion. He doesn't have any other children. Um, this is a topic that as I started to look uh, at who we might invite on yeah. and and even in my own life, what types of experiences and headlines and oh, things that cross the path of your life. This is a heavy, heavy one. Yeah. And for us as men, we would have a, a specific, um, a, a many, many, we could spend hours and hours talking about this, right? But I, I, I called you excitedly because I said, I think we need to have a priest on. Or we need to have somebody who works in this ministry uh, because this is such a divisive um, topic. Yeah, for and, sure. And, you know, even one of our other fellow geeks will be on in another podcast mm-hmm. um, who works in intelligence in the uh, in the yes. arm, uh, it, well, in one of the armed forces, <laughs> we can say. Because we don't even know a yeah. lot, right? He doesn't really share, but he also yeah. comes. He's from... He's in home. between the cracks, as he says. He's yes. Like, I'm, I'm everywhere. I'm in between. He goes, he's in between the little... the. The uh, the stuff that you can do and stuff, you know, I don't know. Well, he's, he's a ghost almost. He's almost like a shadow. Like and the point shadow, of us yeah. talking about our friend Brett, who's mm-hmm. not here on this podcast yeah. yet, is that he brought this up because he said this is such a divisive topic. Who do you think released mm-hmm. the memo, the the, <laughs> yeah. the thing that sparked all this controversy over the last few weeks of Roe v. Wade with the Supreme Court? Because these were documents that were leaked, right? And all of a sudden, you're seeing that the Supreme Court may overturn Roe v. Wade based on these opinions, right? Yeah. And he he said to us, it was likely the Russian government. Mm -hmm. Because, again, this is such a divisive topic. Yeah. So we're going to get a lot of people upset with this broadcast today. And we're going to present information. We're going to learn right alongside you. Mm -hmm. 10, mm-hmm. 20 seconds, 30 seconds of your initial thoughts when you heard that we we're going to be talking about Roe v. Wade and this Supreme Court development. Jace? So just kind of thinking, now before I get to that, you know, this is a somber topic and I don't mean to make light of anything, but just kind of what, what's been shared up until this point is I just want to contribute two thoughts. Um, Dusty mentioned that you all are kind of revamping the podcast and, you know, I for one sure hope that merchandise is a part of that and, uh, I have a pitch for you guys. Uh, Something Dusty said earlier. Could probably be your first sticker or T-shirt or whatever. Uh, You playing small does not serve God. That's something Dusty said probably about five minutes ago. That's a shirt. That's that's a shirt right there. (laughs) Yeah, that's That's a a sticker. That's something right there. So that's a coffee mug if I ever heard one. Exactly, exactly. So there's one right there. Number two, (laughs) Roger said you two too. That to me, (laughs) that's kind of like if. You know, The Edge, Bono, and all the other yeah. guys, oh, the, the, their, yeah. their, their kids started a band. YouTube they could too, be like, U2, too. Like there the Young Avengers. So there you go. U2, too. I well, like that. I guess it has to be a cover band to be U2, yeah. too. Yeah. Right? But you have right. to spell it U, the number two, and then T-O-O. Exactly. Right? Like you, like to make that's, it something like, that's a coffee mug. That, that's a, you know, we're going to have to take a little U tour. Uh, actually, a sharp right. Sure. Because my organization since 1999... To 2017, um, uh, and as the author of Raphael's Way Recovery Program, we are not doing justice, but this is the person that I found that we are going to interview today, that we're going to talk about this yeah. topic with, and she is texting me saying, where are you guys? So oh, let's, yes. let's call yeah. her up. Let's call her up. Let's okay. do that. 
exciting stuff here. I called people at Holy Spirit Church. I called people back at my old parish in Alhambra, California, uh, St. Therese, and all roads led to this person who we are blessed <laughs> enough to have on the phone, Marianne Parks. Marianne, we did a little sure brief accurate. intro before you jumped on the line with us. The Catholic Church, way back in the 5th century, had a very uh, interesting perspective on abortion and, for example, when life begins, etc. Can you talk a little bit about that? And I'm talking specifically about our, our bishop theologian, St. Augustine, and, and what was going on back then. Well, way before that, in the end of the like the second century, in the one hundreds or before the Didache, the teaching of the twelve apostles, supposedly, uh, that one of the earliest church documents uh, condemns uh, what everyone understood was abortion. So, uh, <laughs> so this goes back to the very, very beginning. Um, as and as far as Augustine, I. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that he had the Catholic position, which was a living human being, an innocent human being may never be killed. Um, what was understood as a living human being is what they perhaps didn't know. Like St. Thomas, for instance, did not realize that uh, that the child in the womb was a human body from the very beginning. That see. The understanding was that a soul, a human soul, needed a fitting body to to um, be the ensoulment of. And they didn't know that at the very beginning that the the embryo was genetically a human being and a fitting subject for the soul to be present in from the very beginning. So that's why now we know, of course. And the amazing thing about Roe versus Wade is that they actually left a big gaping hole in their decision. They said, we're not going to decide uh, what a human being is or something like to that effect where life begins. But when science finds out, then our, our decision will, can change. Well, they've completely dropped that whole concept of when science found out because science found out about two weeks later with sonograms. Well, it's interesting. What, what's present to me as I hear you talk about this is yes, this was a different time and we didn't have a, as great a knowledge of science and biology as we do now, clearly by far, right? And, and these, these people had theories about the human soul not being present for, for some weeks into pregnancy. That, that's kind of what was present to me when I was reading up on this. But until you also there was, have, you also until have some there was very, a human body. That's right. You also have some immediately as soon as we started talking you had some very strong opinions about the catholic church and where we failed in 1973 i read that this decision was coming down the pike and i went to mass on sunday and thought wow now this is we're going to have to have a, a prayers at mass about this well i waited in vain it never ever happened the church was silent church was silent afterwards it was absolutely amazing um and I will say, you said something very interesting. You said that topic was abortion within the Catholic Church. There's a lot of abortion within the Catholic Church. Statistically, every Catholic family has lost someone and terribly affects everyone. The mothers, the fathers, the grandparents, the siblings, the future siblings, the future spouses. No matter how it comes down, we are still a post-abortive society and a post-abortive church, and there's so much woundedness and anger. The main, the main effect of abortion on men is anger. The main effect of abortion on women is anger. Uh, they tend to turn it on themselves. Men tend to turn it outwards. But no matter what the decision is, this anger is, you can see it in our society now. We're a post-abortive society. And if we don't heal the the wounded in our midst, we will never overcome abortion. Uh, the way to stop them is number one, show people what it will do to them. The baby is the big boogeyman in our society now. Oh, they're the scariest thing in the world. The, the only the only fear that you can strike into people's hearts now is the baby. 
from the time they're, you know, middle school on up. Don't don't get pregnant. It'll ruin your life. So um, that's the situation we're in. Unless we can show people that abortion will hurt them, and unless we can heal the post-abortive, because we're now on fourth, fifth generation of abortion. Let's talk a little bit about that, because you have obviously experience. Starting in 1974, I started working with crisis pregnancy pregnancy endeavors, you know, Um, and then we lived overseas for a while and I saw abortion spreading in Europe more than here, even uh, helping. Oh, we'll give you everything you need and then you won't do it. Well, no, there's something there's other things going on. And I finally saw when I was working for Birthright back in the late 80s, I asked one woman and I said, well, tell me, why do you want to have an abortion? And she said, if I let this baby be born, I'll see the other three that I aborted. Oh and my. I don't want I don't want to know. That's what something powerful. That, so yeah. that's, and that's when I saw that blew my mind open. That's when I saw that abortion creates abortion, that the denial and the fear that follow abortion and the anger and the disrupted lives uh, creates more abortion. And so I went to a convention of pro-life workers shortly thereafter, and the person there was saying, oh, the post-abortive need to get down on their knees and repent. They're doing evil. They're murdering. And I'm like, I raised my hand and I said, if you can't understand where the post-abortion are coming from, then you can't, uh, where the people who want abortions are coming from, you can't help them. You need to understand what's driving them. And if we don't help them. source of it, right? There's no future. They are the future of the pro-life movement. And we're seeing that now as more and more uh, post-abortive people recover and uh, take leadership roles. Share their stories. Yeah. Before we connected with you, the guys were all talking about how many times we're kind of left out. And this is a bunch of guys sitting at this table other than you now. Uh, we're left out of the decision many times. This is yeah. a woman's choice. And I know men who have been uh, really hurt by the choice that the woman is made to abort their baby. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's a, a very sad testament to obviously the state of the world that we've come to this point. However, the other topic that was brought up by Jason, who's sitting at this table with us, is the fact that the, uh, the church has many different services available, many different ministries that are trying, even you've said that, uh, and and that there are many resources, not only spiritual resources, but actual uh, physical resources available to people. That the church, perhaps, it's like the best kept secret. They don't they don't share this. And so, one of the things that we wanted to do in giving you a, a voice here today is to talk about what what sources, what resources are available within the Catholic Church. Yeah, uh, okay. we're not just condemning people. As a matter of fact. As I started doing research on this topic, that's the last thing that the church does is actually condemn people and be divisive, that's right. right? That's right. That's right. We judge acts, not people. And we judge acts because we know God knows what hurts people. Evil, bad, bad acts hurt people. <laughs> What's out there? What What can you tell us about? For, for pro-life, of course, the church has been, um, uh, well, Catholics have been in the lead of setting up uh, crisis pregnancy centers, maternity homes, which have kind of faded, sadly. A ministry to the post-abortive called Project Rachel that exists in many dioceses. Yeah, I've um, heard of that one. And one thing I would like to say is that this ministry is for men as much as for women. Men are equally injured by abortion, just like you said. Um, and that one of the things it does is it breaks the communications, it breaks down the relationship between men and women. Men who say, it's your choice, think they're being strong. It's going against their grain, but they've been trained by society to say that. It's your choice. And they don't like doing it. The girl hears, the woman hears, I don't care. You know, so they're saying the communication is not happening there. She hears, I don't care, you go take care of it. But 60, over 60% of women report feeling coerced. And over 50% of men say they were strongly influential in the decision. So, and there's all kinds of um, ways 
that people are affected. And it doesn't matter whether they were for it, against it, passive, or whatever, it still affects the man the same way. And it has a very emasculating effect on men. And it has effect on the women they later choose often. Roger uh, has... I don't mean to put you on the spot, no, Roger. Okay. You shared with me something yes. that was very personal mm-hmm. to you. When I yeah. shared that, that Marianne was going to be with us, you said, mm-hmm. I know her ministry. Yes. How do you know her ministry? Um, the reason when Dustin had, when Dusty had mentioned that you were in the ministry, uh, the reason it hit me hard is because he was talking about it, and I was like, I, I, know, I know that ministry. And the reason I know that ministry is I have five beautiful children, thank God, but we've had two miscarriages. One early, I think like a month miscarriage, which was devastating for us. I'm and, so sorry. And yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, and another one that was stillborn. So my oh. wife had a deliver, like actually, uh, oh. yeah, uh, delivery. Did, I've, I've done, uh, I developed a miscarriage retreat. Did you go to one of those? Yes, yes, that's exactly the one I talked. Yes, it, it was a miscarriage ret- uh, retreat, and um, it, I, I'll tell you what, it, it it helped me and my wife. Uh, and it's interesting to note yes. that Roger, you you weren't in the faith at the point no. when this happened, right? You were not no. actively in our faith. I wasn't actively in the faith at the time. Um, I was reluctant to go, obviously. I uh, figure, you know, oh, well, it's it's not that big of a deal. I kind of told myself, you know, kind of like, yeah. oh, you know, it, it's not that big of a deal. Um, it, it's, it's over, and what can you do about it? Yeah. the way a guy thinks, I can't fix it. So. Yes, exactly. So uh, I, I reluctantly went, and, yeah, I, well, now I know it, it was you, so I, I would thank, I thank oh. you personally uh, for that ministry because— Well, it's a joy to do. Yeah. They get caught in a kind of a false sense of, I can fix this by um, doing penance for the rest of my life. But that makes it about them and God. Yeah. And they never reckon, they never find the peace that they're looking for. And there's a reason for that. And that's one of the effects that abortion has on Catholics. It locks them into bad spiritualities, you know, negative ones, suffering ones. Um, yeah, not not, yeah, not see, the peace yeah. and, not the peace and joy of of the Lord that He mm-hmm. wants us to have, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, but I appreciate those words, and um, and w- we do have a, a lovely miscarriage retreat, and we do uh, yeah. post abortion programs too, support groups, and um, I mean weekly groups and day retreats. Uh-huh. How do we? How do occur, let's let's talk about that first. Well, what are the first, proper ways to deal with it? We can only know Christ as a Savior. So St. Paul was kind of almost proud of his sins because they gave him his ticket to be able to say, look, what God did for me, he can do it for you, and I can pass on that good news. So no matter what the deep, dark sin that we're denying, that we think um Sometimes it's not a sin, but a lot of people carry false guilt. But no matter what the deep, dark thing is that we're carrying, um, we need to know that it can become, it can be given over to the Lord, and we can know the Lord the way he wants to be known as a Savior. And then that very thing that happened can become a source of joy, not because of it itself, but because, well, it's kind of like, falling off a, out of his boat and almost drowning and then getting rescued. When you think of it, you don't, you don't think of how stupid you were to fall off the boat. You think of how wonderful the rescuer was, just like St. Paul did. So that's the first thing. We need to not be, not be stuck in shame and be willing to bring everything to the Lord. Yeah, that could be difficult. Okay. That can be a very difficult yeah. thing to do for someone, right? Well, yes, but... Um, that this is what the church is for. It's not a hotel. It's a hospital. For sinners, yeah. So, for sinners. I mean, so the, 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 the other thing is I'd like to say something to priests. They, they tend to, um, the people who are in the pews, so many of them are post-abortive, 
And like I said, anger is a very common symptom that priests are afraid to talk about it. Yeah, but I, there I is a that. way that you can talk about this in a in an evangelical way. You never t- you never just talk about it as an abstract issue, although it is a very important one. Um, but also with giving the understanding that no matter what's happened in our lives, that the church has a, a way has a way forward and a way to peace and healing and that they belong that they you know that they're welcome the the, the priest can put out the welcome mat and every every christian should put out the welcome mat sure. to sinners what is present to you as you read the newspaper and watch the news regarding this roe v wade decision by the supreme court you know, they talk about the Catholic moment in the public square, that we missed it. And I think we did. We did. Uh, there are five Catholics on the, or more, on the Supreme Court. Um, but I, I, the leaked decision, I didn't like. Uh, it was very legalistic and verbal. And, and I think that any true understanding of the issue If you send it to the states, it's going to come right back to the Supreme Court because this is a right incarnated in the in the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be deprived of life without due process of law. So the question is, what's a person? The uh, Blackman Court didn't address and said they were sidestepping. And whenever anyone figured out the science, they'd be happy to change their mind. Well, let's see. And I think we've already let a lot of. demons loose in society with abortion so there's going to be big reactions no matter what happens well the interesting yeah. point you brought up is roe versus, Ro versus wade it should be overturned because it's, it's just bad law it's even just even there's uh some supreme court pro-choice pro-choice advocates that's admitted the constitutional right to abortion is it's built on sand like it's nowhere exactly. in the constitution it doesn't say there's a right to abortion unless it's like invisible ink or like next to the picture of bigfoot or like you get nicholas cage to come in and try to do a weird mission and find it in the treasure <laughs> it's not in there um they claim it's in the 14th amendment but that it's in uh, the penumbra, yeah, the penumbra. yeah, there you go, yeah, because they say, they say, oh, it's in the fifteen minutes. Well, again, which prohibits a state from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of the law. But then you have to ask, but what does the con- what does that constitute? Like, what does that constitute? It doesn't mean you have the right, the ultimate right, to do whatever you want in private. There's an interesting case in 1997, Washington versus Glucksburg. This was a landmark case in the Supreme Court. The United States uh, unanimously, it was like 9-0, to zero, said that you did not have a right to assisted suicide in the United States. You did not. And again, this is 9-0. Advocates try to say, like, they, the advocates of, of, of assisted suicide wanted it to be a right in all 50 states. But it was struck down and said, no, only the states have the right to decide. What does that sound like? What does that sound like? That sounds like Roe versus Wade. It should be similar. It should be to where uh, the states decide. Well, you know, the one of the uh, the Casey case uh, yes. solidified abortion because every person has the right to decide the meaning of their life, which is yeah. insanity. Yeah, and, which doesn't and, make any sense. Like, how can that be practical? And here, here's another. Here's from this is from a pro-choice legal scholar, John Hart. From the Yale Law Journal, pro-choice, this is a quote, Roe versus Wade is not constitutional law and gives almost no sense of an obligation to try to be. What is frightening about Roe is that this super protected right is not in, inferable from the language of the Constitution, the framers, thinkers, respecting the specific problem and issue, any general value deprived from the p- provisions they included or in the nation's governmental structure. This is also from uh, Kermit Roosevelt from the University of Pennsylvania Law. He's also pro-choice. Quote, you will be hard-pressed to find a constitutional law professor, even among those who support the idea of constitutional protection for the right to choose, who will embrace the opinion itself rather than the result. This is not surprising. As constitutional agreement, Roe is barely coherent. It is time to admit in public that, as an example of the practice of constitutional opinion writing, 
row is a serious disappointment. These are the, the quotes that I read were both from pro choice. Listen, in 1974, political philosopher told me they did it because they wanted it. Period. There's no reasoning in there whatsoever. They just wanted abortion. So they did it. They just fiat. But yes, you're right. All legal scholars agree with that because this has been a question of will only. As they put it, choice. And when you div- devoid, when you separate choice from your intellect's perception of what is good, when your choice defines what is good, you're in real high water, right? Briefly, I went sort of on a little, uh, a little spat about morality and people calling today to the reaction of the crime that occurred in Uvalde of all the innocent children dying and how we, we lack love and morality and we don't respect God's sovereignty over life when these types of events happen. And then I thought about how this is in the headlines today. We're flying our, our, our flags at half mast now. Uh, what is our call as Catholics? to this issue what can we do as a church as a group as individuals to help with this with this plague this darkness we we need to be very sure in our own minds and communicate to everybody in every situation that comes to us that every baby is a gift from god no matter how that baby came about i don't care if it was rape or incest, or uh, uh, some difficult uh, abusive person, or whatever it was, or an affair, or whatever it is, people do bad things, but God uses that as an opportunity to do something good, to help the people who've who've, uh, gotten in trouble, to help them out of it. So a baby comes about, that's a good thing. And there is no such thing as a bad pregnancy or a bad baby. It's not just mother and child. We need to realize that every child has a mother and father. And we have tended to break up the family in talking about this issue. There's a a mother and a father and a child, no matter how difficult the situation is. One of the first things we need to do is try and Keep families together. Um, uh, and, and we need to, very often people will come in a crisis pregnancy because they think mom and dad, have they're going to throw them out or they hate them or whatnot. Instead of stepping in and rescuing, we need to help mom and dad help them. We need to put the family back together while we're saving the baby, as they say. To put it in a nutshell, somebody tells you they're pregnant, no matter what the situation, you smile and you say, congratulations, honey. That's wonderful. That could go a long way. And I mean, no matter what. That is shocking to me. I got to tell you, I'm I'm sitting here putting myself in the shoes of of general population. And I'm thinking, wow, what what did she just say? What did she just say that anything, even rape, that which is one of the quote unquote extreme examples that women and and, and men use, especially uh, in in the public... uh, forums of the news etc right here's the solution to that god has a paint box it has trillions of colors in it they're called genes he's brought them down from adam and eve through thousands of generations and he makes each child out of selected genes that come through people not from people the genes of the father of the rapist father are not his. Every single sperm that he has has different genes in it. They are from his parents and grandparents and great grandparents and all the way back to Charlemagne and Adam. So these are these genes that come through the rapist or through the incestuous partner or through the abusive guy or through whatever happens. These genes are God's paint box. They are not the other person and this child is unique artistic creation of god so as soon as you can distinguish the child in this way from the father that's causing the problem in the per- in our minds you know the criminal or the whatever it was as soon as you can distinguish that the woman has a way to welcome the child for its own sake which 
she usually does once they're born. They found that people recover from rape if they don't have an abortion, but they can't very well recover from it if they do. Wow. It's one trauma on top of another trauma. A trauma on top of another yeah. trauma. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Uh, Marianne, we would love to have you on again because there's, yeah, just there's such so a wealth stuff, of information right? that you can share with us, and that's what this podcast is all about. Our faith, our reason, our logic, and yeah. our us going down rabbit holes and looking at different things as you do all the time, it, it sounds like from everyone who I spoke to about you, they said this person is, is, is a wealth of knowledge. She's brilliant. And, and I don't mean to embarrass you by saying that uh, about you. But, you are embarrassing me, so stop <laughs> it. <laughs> but, 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 but we thank you so much for yes. taking this time. And, and I promise you, I want to take you out to lunch so that we can figure out how we can make a documentary <laughs> uh, and tell more of your story and more of the stories of people who... Like you said, we need to take this out of the darkness and shed light on this. Um, yes. This is a yes. fascinating topic and, 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 yes. and again, and, and, such a powerful topic. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you for addressing this. I'm so happy that you have. It's rare that people are willing to even address it. And it just warms my heart. Well, thank you. And yes. God bless you for, thank for, you. For, for doing the work that you do. And uh, we definitely want to have you back again. Thank you. Okay. Have a good, have a good okay. evening. Yes. God yes. bless. God bless. All right. Bye-bye. Wow, man. I mean, I could have talked to her for a long time. Like, I was just like, lady, talk, talk, Marianne. Go, go. I was cheering. Everything she was saying. I, so was, much I was honestly shocked. I, yeah, well, I, 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 really... I, 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 I'm thinking about the yeah. reaction of our audience. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to get, like, hate mail. We're going to get, like, you know, because this is such a <laughs> divisive got... issue. You're never going to be able to yeah. satisfy everyone. No. Right? But no, no, what no. I'm going to stick to in this particular case mm -hmm. is what she said. We don't know God's plan. But one thing that I have learned in life is that when you let go and you let God, yeah. uh, many, many times in our lives, in my life, he has taken a really horrific or a bad situation and something amazing and good has come of it. And I think I'm going to hold on to that. I have to trust that the morality yeah. and the, the teachings of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, are what I need to follow here, even if it is hard to to yeah. swallow. Well, I'm I'm with you. Like tough subject, this episode is very heavy, um, but they're not always going to be like that. And again, nothing's wrong with with some heaviness, you know, right? Every now and then, I think that's good. Maybe we shy away, like you were saying, not sharing. Not, maybe we shy away too much from that heaviness. Yeah, I, I, because everyone's opinion. trying to be politically correct. Yeah. correct. And and we live in a cancel society. Yeah, where you know if you say the wrong thing, they're going to cancel you. They're going to uh, yeah, they're going to grab their torches and come <laughs> yeah. after you. And you know, certainly that could happen here. Yeah, that really right. could. And they're going to say, "Do you listen to those nutballs? Are you kidding me? Yeah, like what are they thinking?" But yes. I'm going to hold on so, to my faith uh, yeah. here, and I'm going to try to do the right thing, the most moral thing, yeah. the most loving thing. Oh, man. Like, what a great episode. So once again, man, I, I just want to thank you. Uh, again, I am Roger. This is Dusty. Again, I'm so glad to be on this new journey, and it's going to get better and better and better. It's just like I can already see the ideas in my head. Now it's getting it down and getting it through and executing it. But, man... Uh, I'm so excited for this journey to be on. And we got a great episode next. I'm so excited for the next one. But, man, just to wrap this up, once again, faith, reason, and geekdom. If you guys, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get most of the podcasts, can you rate, rate, subscribe? Please subscribe. That's the most important thing. Share us with your friend. Anyone you know, just take their phone. Give us a five-star rating. I don't know who it is. Is it like take the like the tablets? There's tablets. There's iPhones. There's all these different uh, electric devices. Take them. Subscribe. Do it against their will. It doesn't matter. You don't need consent to do that. Just oh, actually, I don't know. Maybe something. I don't know. Don't what do that. Don't proposing? take phones. Propose. I, 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 <laughs> just forcefully, gently propose something. <laughs> and but yeah, again, faith, reason, and geekdom. I am Roger, and I'm Dusty. Peace. Godspeed. <laughs>